Hello class, my name is Gage Karen and I'm going to be doing a essentially guest lecture today on cannibalism in film. So representations of cannibalism in film, what they might mean, um, the relevance to our class, FMP 250, sex and violence in film and TV. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So before you go through today's lecture, there's three optional uh, recommended screenings. So I've included three films here. You'll notice that all three films are actually French films that was not intentional whatsoever. Um, my specialty is the new French extremity movement. And so I just happened to choose these films thinking of them as films in which cannibalism is represented. Um, so we have three options here. We have Raw, which is a 2016 film, often talked about as kind of a film of the remnants of the new French extremity movement being on the much later end of it. In and then we have Trouble Every Day, which is an early film, which some may say is part of the movement, some may not, may say is not. I think it's also a very excellent film. And then In My Skin, which is also from very early on in the new French extremity movement. I recommend that you watch one of these and then come back to the lecture. And then we have a clip for this lecture today, The Neon Demon. I recommend that you watch this clip from the end of the film. Two different ways you could do this. If you've already seen the film, go ahead, watch the clip again. I also recommend if you have time to watch the film yourself so that you can have some context or if you need to, to read the plot description from a website somewhere before you go ahead and, and watch the clip for the end of the film. We'll be doing an analysis of that clip later in the lecture. So why cannibalism? Why would we talk about cannibalism as part of this class? So uh, quite often cannibalism is linked to violence and sexuality in film. It's a very cinematic uh, device to use on film to represent different themes. And so cannibalism is popular, in my opinion, as a thematic device because of its, its cinematic qualities, how easy it is to depict on film, and the many, many different ways in which you can interpret the use of cannibalism in film by filmmakers. And so the exploration of taboos, I'd say overall, is a simultaneous exploration of humanity because we look at the limits of our own morality and we kind of use that to judge what our values are. And we can use this to question the values and to question why those values are in place and what makes them so essential to what we would call humanity and society. So something that is fundamental to our understanding of, of cannibalism's effect on film is the concept of abject horror. So Julia Kristeva, the scholar, um, in The Powers of Horror, wrote that the abject is what a human reacts to in the loss of distinction between ourselves, our own bodies, and the other. So concepts of the other that are not ourselves or the bodies and the, the different physical existence of others, right? And so when you blur that boundary, that's what's abject horror. So for example, um, corpses remind us of our own mortality and our own temporariness as human beings. So seeing a corpse, a corpse is or was a human being. And so to see a dead human being as living human beings reminds us of that mortality. And so the horror, the feeling that we feel there between not being able to distinguish ourselves from the concept of death, that is abject horror. Other things that might be included in abject horror is when you merge things like body horror, when you merge parts of human body with things that aren't human. And it creates that uncanniness where it's, it's, it looks quite human, but you know that it's not 100% human. And also things like open wounds, anything really that reminds us of kind of the fragility of the human body can also be considered abject horror. And so we reject cannibalism quite often because we reject the idea of our bodies as very mortal and of, of, of very capable of being eaten, just like the bodies of animals, plants. And so the rejection of that idea is the rejection of the idea of human beings as quite temporary but also the rejection of human beings who are cannibals because we do not want to accept that something which we would expect an animal to do to eat or attack a human being would be done by another human. And so the disowning of that from humanity when it's actually something that's, that's real is also something that is us separating ourselves from the other to create that distinction that we lose when it comes to the abject. And so let's do a brief history of the representation of cannibalism on film. And so the most popular that I would say that you see is monsters. I would consider this because if you have human-like monsters, it's very easy to draw that, that uh, similarity there and call that cannibalism as well. So if you have zombies, 
um, such as, for example, the girl with all the gifts look featured here on the left screen. Um, vampires as well, human-like aliens, werewolves. I would consider this to be a part of the genre of cannibalism because you have something that looks and acts in many ways human, eating humans, con consuming pieces of humans, you know, in the pursuit of people that they can eat, things like this. And so our exploration of cannibalism can also be looked at through those lenses. But there's always a bit more othering of this monster category because we have some sort of physical attribute that distinguishes the other, the quote unquote monster from the human, right? It's either maybe with the zombies a certain sickness or a certain difference in, in the ways that their bodies were compared to other human beings. And then there's the unfortunate uh, stereotype of indigenous peoples as the quote unquote savage, as the, the cannibals, the people who are dangerous to most often Europeans or Americans. And this is a very detrimental stereotype and I will not be covering it in this video because I think it's, it's a very disrespectful portrayal of indigenous peoples. But some films that might be in this category, in my opinion, would be The Green Inferno, Cannibal Holocaust, Bone Tomahawk, and then my favorite category personally, um, human cannibals. And so this is kind of the quote unquote new cannibal. And there's two categories of these. There's the obligate cannibal, which would be people in survival films who are forced to be cannibals, but don't want to be. And so they're forced to be cannibals to survive, um, eating the remains of either their, their fellow people who they are traveling with, people that they come across. And then there's the active cannibal. So people who have other options of other things to eat, however they choose to um, consume human meat. So this would be Hannibal Lecter, for example from The Silence of the Lambs. And on the left here, we have the Neon Demon also as an example of the active cannibal. So perspective when it comes to representing the cannibals in film really does matter because based on how you relate to the character, this determines your interpretation of their role or of the act that they're taking part of in the cannibalism. And so the most popular perspective as you probably can guess in horror films um, and other films as well, is the cannibal as the antagonist or the cannibal as the other. So these films are the least challenging to our sense of self because they reinforce the cannibal as the other. This idea that we have of denying the cannibal humanity and referring to them as something animal, something unintelligent, something feral, we can easily accept that kind of idea because it, it separates us from this, this thing that many people would consider to be monstrous. And so it doesn't really challenge our, our morals at all. In many ways, these films put this here because it's frightening. And that's, that's a very simple way to look at cannibalism. And so here on the right, we have an image from The Hills Have Eyes, in which we have an interpretation of cannibalism, which is the cannibal as the antagonist, or the cannibals as the antagonist, and who are frightening, and who are antagonistic, and who don't seem to be particularly intelligent this stereotype of the cannibal. Another version of the cannibal that we have is the cannibal is the neutral character. And so they may not be the protagonist, they may not be a very, very central character, but featuring the cannibal as a side character, as multiple side characters, um, as morally ambiguous characters, it does ask us a few more questions about our morality because if they aren't the antagonist, then we are given the opportunity to look at these characters and begin to sympathize with them and begin to be challenged as to why we should sympathize with these characters on screen. For example, we are what we are. There are many more um, neutral cannibal characters in this film. We have many different perspectives from many different characters who have been cannibals or who are cannibals. And so we have the choice of allying ourselves as the viewers with these particular cannibals and seeing their perspectives and their hardships. And we might not consider them to be the quote unquote good guys, but we are encouraged in the film to take their perspective and to see their way of life. And so the abject becomes more prominent because perhaps the more close that the concept of the cannibal becomes to the concept of the self, the more we are forced to confront what differences we may find there to be between ourselves and these individuals. What makes us more human than them? Questions such as these. And so, of course, here we, here we arrive at my favorite. Um, the cannibal is the protagonist, the new cannibal. Something slightly uncommon in film, the humanizing of the cannibal as the self. And so we hear the story or the story is told from the perspective of the cannibal. And so 
this is a huge narrative challenge in itself for a filmmaker because you have to get the audience to sympathize with the cannibal and with their cause and with their interests. To successfully be able to do that, you need to provide a reason for the cannibalism. You need to provide a very detailed story for this individual, and it needs to be a very well fleshed out character. And so there is a strong conflict often between the audience members and the cannibalistic practices because it is about imagine if you were here in this situation because we ally ourselves with the protagonist and we put ourselves in the protagonist's space. And so this is where we find the most abject horror is the horror of the monstrous quote unquote as the self, the human monster. And so this causes questions to be raised of what is the difference between animality and, and humanity? You know, what is, uh, what's the moral limit here of what human beings can do to one another? And so to backtrack slightly, a few more details about the different types of cannibalism you might see on film. We've talked about perspective. We've talked about the different ways that, uh, the different context in which um, cannibalism is occurring. And so let's add some more detail to that. So there's a couple different other things you should know. There's literal or simple cannibalism, which is the consumption of human flesh directly. There is accidental cannibalism, which is unknowing consumption. You know, if you've seen Soylent Green, Soylent Green is people. Spoiler alert, it's, it's a bit of an older film, but where uh, foodstuffs being used in the future, it's actually made from human remains. And then you have identity cannibalism, which is the figurative or literal cannibalizing of someone else's identity or personality or physical attributes by eating them. Um, and we'll see this in Raw and the Neon Demon. There's also sexual cannibalism, which is when you pair themes of or physical sexuality with the uh, consumption through cannibalism on camera. So for example, with the film Trouble Every Day, you have a film that explores uh, fidelity and desire and lust and choices, the regulation of these, of these choices and these urges, but it's paired directly with sexuality and cannibalism. These two things are inseparable in the film. And so an exploration of the cannibalistic uh, temptations and attributes of these characters is also an exploration of the sexual urges of these characters and the infidelity of these characters but also questions of, do they have remorse for either of these things, for not being faithful or for consuming other human beings? It's kind of a melancholic film. If you haven't chosen it to watch for this lecture, I highly recommend watching it at some other point as well. So let's look at one example. So cannibalism as a metaphor. So in the film Raw by Julia Ducourneau, cannibalism is used in a very cinematic way to explore the coming of age story in a very different way from the perspective of the cannibal. So you have a young girl who goes to college for the first time. She's from a family that is very, very strictly vegetarian. She's not allowed to eat meat. And so, you know, the classic story of getting away from home, you have these freedoms, you have the ability to try new things. And so she tries to eat meat and discovers that there is this urge within her to eat human meat. And so it's a self-discovery story through the story of cannibalism, of her discovering her own cannibalistic urges, but at the same time, discovering her own sexuality, discovering her individual identity away from her parents. And so the development of her, her cannibalism and of her desires as a cannibal is parallel to the development of her own sexuality, her exploration of her sexuality, and her coming to balance the, what she feels are animal urges within herself and the balancing of, of humanity and of morals within herself. And there's a foil character, which is her sister character. Um, and this character doesn't balance those things very well. And so you have a comparison between these two characters and how they developed and the choices that they make in terms of what they choose to do or choose not to do. And you also see a bit of, like I said before, that identity cannibalism, because initially you have this character, the main character, Justine, imitating her sister character, who's the other cannibal, copying that identity, but then coming to realize and reject that identity, which doesn't suit her because of the morality that she has, which her sister doesn't have. This was just an example of how we can use cannibalism in a narrative story to discuss different themes and to explore things that don't have anything to do with the, the physical cannibalism going on on screen. So looking into other films that represent, uh, that have cannibalism in them, I would have you ask these questions.
So how does the presence of cannibalism in the film relate to the plot and the character arcs? So how does the cannibalism in the film become more pre prevalent? When does it appear in relation to what's happening in the story? What are the characters going through? What are their emotions like? What drives them to do these things? And then which variety of cannibalism is it that's happening on screen? Is it identity cannibalism? Is it sexual cannibalism, simple cannibalism? From what perspective are we viewing the cannibalism? Is it the protagonist? Is it a neutral character, a secondary character? Is it the antagonist? And so this will help you in your analysis of um, the cannibalism that we see on the screen. So let's go back and review the clip. So you all should have watched it by now from the Neon Demon. So we're going to talk about the very end of the film. You have these uh, three witch characters. Many of them are, many people refer to them as witches. I will for convenience, but it's not said explicitly in the film. Um, so you have the three witch characters and you have the young character, Jesse, who's come to LA to become a model. And so she arrives in LA, she meets these three characters and is quote unquote taken under the wing of one of them. What they essentially do is they take her and she's killed and she's eaten by the three individuals. Now these three individuals are also models. What the purpose of eating her is, is to acquire her attributes, her youth, her beauty, so that they themselves can be more successful. I, I think I misspoke. Only two of them are models, but um, one of them is a makeup uh, artist, I believe. And so they, they eat her with the purpose of acquiring her attributes, which we would also call endocannibalism, and in many ways, identity cannibalism. However, this doesn't suit so well for some of the characters. Two of the characters have no problem at all. Um, you see one character who's a model being quite a ghost of herself. You know, she feels quite empty. She feels that she just isn't who she used to be. And then you have the other model character who uh, believes that she can manufacture her own beauty. She's gone through several plastic surgeries. And at the very end of the film, after having eaten this character, Jessie, her body physically rejects Jessie's flesh by essentially throwing up um, a part of her body and saying, you know, I need to I need to get her out of my body because of the way that she was having a reaction to it. And in many ways, this itself embodies the abject horror of cannibalism. And so in this film, we see identity cannibalism because of them attempting to acquire her characteristics and the way in which it is rejected because of either the moral aspect or a physical aspect. You know, I think that's up for interpretation as well. Thank you all for listening today. I just wanted to provide a list of the films that were mentioned in case you'd like to check any of them out yourself. Um, it's been lovely speaking with you. I'm going to continue my studies of cannibalism and film and the new French extremity movement, which is my niche. Um, I hope you have a lovely day. And I hope that you will come by my channel and check out some other videos on these topics soon. Thank you.